They didn't give you much of a break, did they? Okay, how are we feeling? We doing okay? It's been good content, right? Excellent, okay. So I wanna know how many people, my name is Rob Hunden, first of all. We're gonna get started. We, we um, have 35 minutes in this great session. I just wanna find out how many people here are from DMOs? Huge chunk of the room. How about EDCs? Okay, a nice contingent. How about other? Okay. <laughs> all right, well, very good. Well, I'm super thrilled to be here today. Uh, like I said, my name is Rob Hunden from Hunden Partners. Um, we've got a nice team here, and we've been a, 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 a partner of a City Nation Place for many years and really think that what they're doing makes a ton of sense, and we have always believed in the convergence of a great place to live is a great place to work is a great place to visit. And today, we are going to be talking um, to, a, to and about a community that we've identified that actually is making all of that happen. Um, it's a place called Carmel, Indiana, um, and it is in a, in a county called Hamilton County, Indiana, and both of them are pretty um, incredible, and so we'll sort of talk about that, but there's a lot of, a lot of lessons to learn here. So um, I'm gonna get started, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of background. So we're gonna have this scrolling thing going behind us. We've got about, I don't know, 25 or 30 slides. We're gonna have this scrolling behind us and that's gonna give you a little bit of before and after of what's happened in Carmel over the last 25 years. Uh, but also it's gonna show you some of the cool things that we've discovered in terms of their visitation um, from not only the county but the rest of Indiana and beyond Indiana, even though um, it's a suburban community of Indianapolis. So the thing that's so interesting to us about this community is it's a suburb of 100,000 people and um, there are lots of suburbs of 100,000 people that are well-to-do around every city in this country. So why are cities from around the country sending delegations to go visit Carmel and find out what they're doing to make it such a great place to live, work, play, and visit? Um, and so um, I'm here with um, two folks from um, Carmel and Hamilton uh, County, Indiana, and I will have them introduce themselves, and then we'll get into a bit of a Q&A, and you're gonna learn along the way, and they're gonna explain what's happened. So, Jeff, I'll start with you. Give us a little introduction. Sure, uh, my name's Jeff Worrell. I'm on the Carmel City Council, serving my eighth year. Uh, prior to that, I was on the Redevelopment Commission for 18 years. And that's the organization that put together all of the public-private partnerships that we're going to be speaking about today. I'm, I'm a, an elected official, but I am proud to be in the room with professionals. I have learned a ton. Yeah, thank you so much, Jeff and Brenda. I'm Brenda Myers, and I'm the president and CEO of Hamilton County Tourism, Inc. Um, we are the DMO for the county, and um, Carmel is one of four cities that we have in our community. It's our largest city, and it's also where our headquarters is. Yeah, so, and we're really focused on placemaking, right, in this, in this conversation. So that's what we're going to talk about is quality of place. So I'm going to sit down and we're going we're gonna to get right to it. So, um, and, and, we, and so Hunt and Partners, by the way, we've worked in Hamilton County for a long time. It happens to be my home county, but that's not why we work there. We work all over the country. Um, but I happen to know a lot about it, but I've been working there on and off for 20 years on lots of pla placemaking that by the way, has been led by, in many cases, the DMO. So if you're a DMO and you're not a leader in placemaking, you should be. Now I see that this thing is right in my way. So for all of you over there, hello. Um, yeah, so we, we may all, sh maybe shift a seat. How about okay. we do that? That'll be fantastic. All right. There so. we go. Um, so Jeff and Brenda, we've introduced each other. Um, so this all started about 25 years ago in Carmel when the population was much less. Um, so, like I said, Carmel is an affluent, you know, it's one of the wealthiest suburbs of Indianapolis. Great. Every big city has wealthy suburbs, right? So, um, but in the 80s and 90s, um, the new mayor at that time, um, who is 25 years in or more now, um, recognized that only having housing as a long-term strategy was a losing fiscal proposition, right? You can't support school systems, you can't support roads and all that if you only have housing. You've gotta have commercial development and density. Um, so, and with the best school system in the state, there was a lot of risk involved. So what was the mayor's plan 
in the mid-90s when he got elected with commercial and cultural development and how did density play a role. So tell us about being in the room when he got elected and started to tell you of his ideas. Well, the year was 1996, and um, it just so it was a coincidence that I was president of the Chamber of Commerce that year. <clears throat> and the mayor, the new young mayor who no one knew, this guy came out of nowhere. Uh, we all were supporting the incumbent that had been there for a while, and he wanted to meet with the chamber. We, had, we were headquartered in an old farmhouse, which is so typical of you know what we were back in those days. And, um, and so he comes running up the stairs to the third floor to the attic where you have the board of directors for uh, Carmel in those days, the, you know, the attorneys and the CPAs and the business owners who were all sitting around like this and he is loaded with arms full of poster board. And I'm gonna get to my point here, but I want you to understand the context. We were, the only thing we had were schools back in those days. And he had a poster board showing what he thought Carmel could become. A new built environment, a brand new downtown starting from scratch. His presentation went about an hour. He blows out of the room. Everybody literally is in total shock saying what just happened? No one, including me, believed it was even remotely possible. And now I'm happy to say 26 years later, um, it, it has been unbelievable what has happened. So my point there is, and maybe you are that person, there has to be a driver. There has to be someone who is willing to, at almost any cost, and I don't mean fiscal cost, but any cost, be willing, if you believe in it, to make it happen, and it can. Yeah, so then what were those major investments? I saw these happen over the years, and it was public infrastructure, it was uh, commercial, it was public-private partnerships, it was leveraging TIF in a big way. That's so right. what were these big projects, and what was the, the spine? Yeah, so um, the spine was we had an old railroad track that had been abandoned that ran north to south through our community all the way uh, from Indianapolis. And Indianapolis had started to talk about developing that. The first thing that he did, and it was over 300 individual lawsuits that had to happen in order to gain control. Uh, I mean, some people owned like, uh, you know, like 500 feet of, of a railroad right away, the way Indiana does its law. So that was the first thing, to create a beautiful, walkable bike, uh, multi-use path through, um, through Carmel north to south. The other thing was, to take north of our uh, main street was a, just a typical old rundown neighborhood that, uh, you know, these are 1950s houses, nothing unique about them, single story, very plain, and he decided that he would put in, and, and we had swales, you know, there were no sidewalks, no curbs, no gutters. He put in curbs, gutters, all that infrastructure, beautiful street lights, old fashioned, really expensive street lights, all the infrastructure. And now that is one of the gems of our community because it has all been redeveloped with you know, personal money, uh, people tearing down houses and building. Then um, creating a master plan for what we call um, city center. I just, it was just up there. City center was a master plan and begging a developer to look at Carmel, uh, to have anything to do with Carmel. Master plan that inc included quite a, f quite a few different uh, segments and get the engine running. The, um, we started at zero. Our annual TIF revenue, uh, every year we bring in $32 million in TIF revenue. We're a city of 103,000. And so it's pretty incredible. So the other thing you did is you had existing corporate headquarters along one area that you were able to use that TIF money to leverage to build some major cultural institutions that really helped drive Carmel as a destination. So the Center for the Performing Arts, Correct. that was a risk. That was a huge risk. Um, so where some communities choose sports, some communities choose something else, our mayor believed that we could be the arts capital of our area. I don't know if that's the right way to say it, but that arts would be our focus. And so we built a um, $180 million uh, performing arts center, which is a 1600 seat theater with uh, perfect acoustics, a performance hall, a uh, 1200 seat fly, proscenium fly theater, 
a um, black box theater of 800 seats and an outdoor small amphitheater. And that was the anchor. And that is also part of our city center with a beautiful uh, green space that is also activated. Yeah, absolutely. So there's all these big anchors coming along. And then they also did, there, this was something I thought. The, yeah, that's our performing arts center right there. Yeah, so that's the Palladium right there. And, and the other thing that they did is they made a deal with the state to take over um, a, a big highway. And they said to the state, we'll take this highway off your hands. Um, and the state actually paid the city to take it off their hands. And you use that money to convert that highway into a parkway with roundabouts that would no longer have semis going on it. So um, it went from a very dangerous, clogged traffic light situation yes. to yes. a gorgeous parkway with roundabouts. Right. It was your typical four lane divided highway, uh, north to south through Carmel, stoplights every, felt like every, uh, you know, 600 feet. But, uh, and we had multiple deaths. It was uh, T-bone accidents all the time. And we did separated grades, uh, roundabouts on the top. In case you don't know, uh, Carmel, Indiana is known for its roundabouts. We have 160 of them. We only have eight stoplights left. One will remain permanently because it was one of the first in Indiana. But uh, this separated grade highway is what then also created an environment where corporations would start to look at us as to being able to, uh, because of our quality of life, be able to move their corporation headquarters to us. And that's really what started to happen as all how, these corporations. How many corporate headquarters do you have right now? We have 132 regional and national corporate headquarters, all uh, office-based type of HQ. It's, it's incredible. So Brenda, how has Carmel's strategy for placemaking inspired other cities in the county and elsewhere around the state and country, right? Because people are visiting from all over. Lots of success, different approaches. Um, let's look at Westfield versus Fishers versus Carmel and the character of development and tourism, where people come from to visit. So we, we have some maps showing like the heat maps of where people hang out in Carmel and I don't know if we have the Fishers District. Yeah, there's Fishers there, which is a very highway oriented, sort of more of a cookie cutter style development um, versus Carmel's very authentic and unique and walkable environment. So let's talk about the different strategies of these cities and how that's shaped things. Well, I, I always compliment the city of Carmel because I feel like it raised the bar for everybody. Um, and for a long time, I think that we had a lot of elected officials who would not have admitted that. But I think, I think now they understand. First of all, we have roundabouts throughout the county now. We have hundreds of roundabouts. And for someone who is perennially late, I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, but um, so Fishers was 96%. So, so Carmel and Fishers are the, the edge communities to Nash, I mean, to Indianapolis, right? So um, 96th Street is the wall. I'm just joking. But and I, and some, I'm bilingual, so I speak both languages. And so um, 96th Street is the wall. Fishers um, is 96% property tax dependent. Um, on you would, housing. On house, housing, on residential housing. And, and I don't know if you know in Indiana, but we went to a one, two, three property tax um, program. Yeah. And there, you, cannot, you cannot run a city on 96% at 1%. Does that make sense, AV? And so they had a town manager. They decided to become a, a city and, and get a mayor. And that town manager actually was mayor. And he's, and he's a financial genius. I mean, he teaches finance at the college level, and he's very good. And so they began redeveloping their downtown, which was which is all grass. And so and did a beautiful job of doing infill and housing and infrastructure. You know, it was a public-private partnership, so it was really good. But there was a big giant um, uh, industrial complex off the interstate that was owned by some eighty-something-year-old man who, you know, he was going to pick what was going to go in there, right? Um, so at some point. Things changed, and we got an IKEA, and we got a Top Golf, um, and the city made a decision. So their downtown is is walkable and really crafted and really high density. But the on the other side of the interstate, it's it's a classic suburban interstate entertainment zone, right? We have um, we're getting a chicken and pickle, and I mean, and it, and it and when you look at the heat map of Fishers of where people go, that's the red hot spot, right? Is right there where all that that is, and there's a there's an outdoor lifestyle mall. So Carmel, I always joke, looks like it has the chicken pox. When you look at those, it's got little hot spots everywhere instead of having all of its um, tourism travel 
concentrated in one exit. So now we go north. So think of us as a square. We go north and we have a city called Noblesville. It's the historic city. It's the county seat. It's on the river. It's a beautiful little downtown. But at some point, they developed a mall exit, right? An outdoor lifestyle mall exit. Also, we have two hospitals out there, and we have a Live Nation amphitheater of 26,000, which at one point was out in the sticks. It was out in the middle of the country. And that's another red hot burning ember, and that generally, both of those two generate more day travel than they do overnight travel. Yeah. And, and then we have the other city is Westfield, and many of you have heard of Grand Park, the sports campus. Um, that's in Westfield, that's just north of Carmel. And there's the map. And there's the map. And um, Westfield is the largest, one of the largest um, youth sports complexes, and that came out of our office. Um, we did, uh, and Rob did some of the feasibility work for that. Um, it, it has far exceeded expectations. I, I think of Grand Park as that child that you absolutely love, but that drives you crazy, because that's exactly what they do. They really are a big disruptor to our hotel and lodging market. And so um, we have four very distinct cities. Um, all of them are better because of Carmel and all the work that Mayor Brainerd did. I laugh because he's still, I still picture him holding large pictures and walking into a room, right? And he's to, to this day, that's how he operates. He gives you the vision first, and then he coaxes coax you along and gets you, to, gets you to do it. So one of the things that I think is important as you're thinking about placemaking is how do you leverage success, right? So let's everybody, most communities and destinations um, have something that's sort of your calling card that you feel good about that you can leverage, right? Not everybody has a beach or, or whatever, but you have something. Certainly in Indiana, there are not a lot of beaches. Um, but they have the Monon Trail we, in we Carmel. We have two in <laughs> <laughs> uh, so they had the Monon Trail in Westfield. They had Grand Park, and we thought, you know, this is great. It's, and it is the most visited youth sports um, complex in the country. It, it beats the Disney, ESPN, Wide World of Sports, and we're very, all very proud of that, right? Very proud. Um, but we believe they missed an opportunity to leverage that into a truly walkable destination downtown, like whatever, like around there. Now you'll have. Chick-fil-A and every other, you know, outlaw fast food place you can imagine is right there by, um, by Grand Park. And it's like, you've got millions of people coming for the first time and many times to, to central Indiana from all over the Midwest and, and nationally. And this is the experience they have in Westfield. Many of those folks, they don't, I mean, you can do fast food, but then what, right? Where do they end up? They end up going to downtown Carmel. Midtown. They go to Midtown, they go to the Arts and Design District, they go up and down, they see shows at the Palladium, they go to the Central Park, they go to uh, the Monon Center. So it's, it's sort of like, we had this one community build this great attractor, but then there was nothing for those folks to do after the games were done. And so it was great to see that, and, and when you compare and contrast, say, Fishers and Carmel, Carmel thought about density and walkability and authenticity, right? You will not find any nationally branded retailers or restaurants that I know of, except for maybe that olive oil place, um, well, right? Which is in a lot of cutesy downtowns, right? Um, but it's all, it's all local or unique and authentic, and it's walkable and it's dense, and when you go to Fisher's, it's national name brands at the side of the highway. And so let's compare and contrast the assessed value and how that um, compares. So Carmel's assessed value this year is certified at 10.1 billion. Last year it was 8.6 billion. We've been on these really tremendous growth spurts. I'm sure a lot of you have. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so the, and as an example, the uh, IKEA and Top Golf that uh, Brenda was just speaking about takes up 50 acres and is that hot spot in Fishers. We have two and a half acres in Carmel that is the Sophia Square that has been cycling through, which is just a four-story mixed-use building. They both generate the same amount of assessed value. So we have chosen to go up, to have mixed-use pro projects, high density, uh, allow our independent restaurateurs and small shops in order to have that customer base that are located just maybe right above them in order to sustain our downtown. So Jeff, you get 
delegations from all over. It's not just other suburbs coming to Carmel to see what you've done because, you know, we have another client, Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, that said, oh yeah, we went to Carmel, roundabouts, all the great stuff, we love it. But you're getting big cities coming to you. What's going on with the city of Denver bringing 35 people? And, and, and this is happening every week. So why, why are these big cities coming and looking at this suburb? Well, I guess I, I, we don't maybe realize it, but we, I, we're learning that our story is maybe a little unique, that there is this huge ability to create this brand new, walkable, built environment. And in our case, Denver, as an example, uh, came. that one was just really three weeks ago, and it was top of mind. I led a couple of the tours, and they, I, you know, I kind of felt like I was in the big city and they were the small towners because they were looking up and around as we were walking through uh, Armona and going, how did you guys do this? And that's really what it comes down to. How did you do this? How do you get a developer? We demand high standards. We have, we're very critical. We own our brand. Uh, it, you can't just come to Carmel and build what you want. You have to build what we want. And so that has... You know. is, isn't it true when you do a business attraction that you you don't abate you your abatement is I've invested in this beautiful place. That's right. And if you want to come here, you're welcome to come here, and that's that's what they do. Yeah, the yeah. letter says uh, we don't do yeah. abatements. We don't do abatements. Uh, but yeah. if you want to be here, you and you want your employees to be happy here, we have uh, invested a ton of resources into infrastructure in order to make that. Happen. I mean, we haven't even talked about their park system, which is really extraordinary. Um, and I, I, I just, I, I can't even begin to explain how working with Carmel, like for example, you know, we do studies all the time that, just like you do, that talk about name recognition and, um, and Carmel's always the city that is most recognized in all of our studies. We have Grand Park, which is, you know, the largest sports complex, a youth sports complex in the country as far as competitive nature is concerned. But yet Carmel is the name that everybody knows. Isn't that interesting? So uh, I want to talk about financing and I want to talk about um, events uh, because I think both of those are secret sauce items, right? Ingredients to your success. So if it weren't for creative financing, none of this would have happened, right? right? So let's talk about that first and then bold, I... Bold and creative. Yeah. Bold and creative financing with yeah. really amazing uh, attorneys that we've, that we've worked with. And then we'll talk about events and how that really plays a huge role too. Yeah, well you must have a strong constitution, um, you know, because we are, um, we are looking at each project when we aggregate land. Um, I mean, we have examples where it's hard to get elected when you show your residents that you bought a piece of land for 1.2 million and you sold it to the developer for 600,000. That's, that's a tough one to, um, when it comes election time. But it is, it's all about putting the package together, looking at the assessed value, and understanding that the TIF, um, in our, our case, uh, we were making $43,000 on the proscenium. We bought the land at a sheriff's sale it was an old warehouse, and it now throws off almost a million dollars in TIF on an annual basis. But it is, it, and we are then able to include public parking, free public parking. We have 11 parking garages now in our uh, network along our spine, the Monon Trail. And we are creating something where a corporate headquarters wants to come because their, their employees want to live there. So the, the financing is, it, it, everyone is different. It's usually a TIF. We try and, you know, sometimes it's a 100% TIF to the developer because it's such a big project. We're now getting to the point where we can start to recover some of that TIF revenue for our redevelopment commission and keep the wheels churning. Yeah, that's, uh, it's amazing. And so, uh, and we're happy to talk afterwards to anybody yeah. about all these things because it gets into the weeds pretty quickly. But, but events, um, it, you, you talked about parking, which wasn't a question, but it should be because that's the number one thing when we do tours and studies, right? We do these great tours and studies everywhere. People love the activity of events and cool shops and restaurants, but they, but they all complain about parking, right? So, so Carmel's made it a, a key sort of tenet of, of your, your to-do list that free parking is part of the deal. It is, and it's really part, it started out as part of our 
willingness to make sure we had the, the customers to serve our businesses that we were trying to encourage to come to Carmel, but it also assists us as we now activate all of these areas for our festivals and fun activities like our Chris Kindle Market, Porch Fest, that kind of thing. So great segue to, to events. So when we, so Carmel itself, City of Carmel actually funds uh, people that work in for the city that churn out these events, right? So they're constantly, this Carter Green that is the area uh, between all of the performing arts venues is activated almost all year. Right. Um, so they're it's getting ready to get more activation with the light show. Yeah. Right. So and and they and they determine that wait things get kind of quiet at night over here. We need to activate it at night. So now they've invested a couple million dollars in in tw uh, twenty um, projectors to do a it laser is, light show. It is going. It's ex we both got a sneak preview of it. It's 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 mind boggling. It is it's really mind it's it's going to be spectacular. I'm uh, offering you a uh, the opportunity to come visit us and see the light show. <laughs> Uh, we open August 31st, okay. um, it, but it, it is actually doing a light show on the Palladium, which is our performing arts yeah. center. And it isn't just flashing some lights up there, it's, it's really spectacular. And we, yeah. we funded the first show, the development of the first show. Very good. So, and, and you, so that visual right there is a ULI award-winning um, development called Midtown Plaza. Yeah. So there's those complete streets really connecting all these dots that you see here from downtown all the way to um, where the Palladium is. Um, there's a development now that's going to fill in that gap where you don't see red dots. Um, so, but the events are what really, I mean, there are constantly events being programmed. And then during the winter, there's the Chris Kindle, Kindle Mart. Um, you ice, have ice, ice, the, the ice event. skating rink is out there for months. Um, you've got, you know, something at every turn, there's always something going on that's programmed. And they, they try to break even on it, um, but they're also funding that with TIFF. There's a huge public art program, so almost not every single roundabout has public art, but most do, as you can see in some of these slides. Um, so there's just a real investment in quality of place and space. And talk about the damn flower pots. Yes, uh, you know, something that is, I think, residents, we take it for granted, but again, trying to create an environment that is special and unique for our residents. What we didn't realize, I remember those early meetings, I don't think we realized that would then bring in all, I mean, not just tourism, but it would bring in these corporate headquarters who then bring employees because they know they want to live in Carmel. Every light pole in Carmel throughout our entire um, city has beautiful hanging flower pots. And maybe there's someone out there, this is not a big deal to you, but we actually have full-time trucks that all they do is go out and water those things every day, seven days a week, et cetera. You work with Prime Light. You work with some nonprofit partners, right? For we did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We provide the equipment yeah. and yeah, employees. But just little things like that. The art in the roundabouts that you talked about, uh, art in our public locations, and then we actually fund or arts organizations that utilize our Center for the Performing Arts. We have nine resident companies uh, from orchestra to theater and um, all those are done with um, nonprofits that operate with uh, some uh, help from the city, but they have to stand on their own. So some of these slides that you're seeing right now um, talk about where people come from. And so we use placer.ai um, and, and, and I should mention that um, and Brenda was going to mention it, but I'm just sort of getting ahead of it myself a little bit. We're doing a huge um, countywide tourism study right now for um, Hamilton County, and it's um, the EDA through because of COVID and all that funded many of these around the country, and we're doing about six or seven um, in partnership with MMGY, and th they're great. Um, so we've been we've been assessing all their POIs, their places that attract people, right? And what's so interesting from a placemaking perspective is, um, and these slides will come back, but when you see these stats, you're gonna see that we, we have a thing called QGIS, which not only shows us how far away people come uh, to go to a place, but um, we actually know if they were inside the county or say outside the county, but in Indiana or outside of Indiana. So I said, let's figure out um, those breakdowns, not just the distances, but are they from outside the county or outside of Indiana? And what you see in some of those lists with the statistics is you'll see that the more interesting the place, which Carmel is showing up on, 
the higher the percentage of people coming from out of state to go to those. And so more than 50% in a lot of these um, attractions uh, that we call them POIs, points of interest, um, in Hamilton County, but especially in Carmel, more than 50% from outside the county and um, often uh, almost double the percentage, sometimes almost to 20% are from out of state, which when you're in central Indiana, you, you have to want to go there, right, if you're from out of state. So we think that that's really interesting. This is also, I don't know, Ricky, if we can just um, hold this slide real quick uh, or go back. Yeah, the one that has the checklist. So I asked, so um, City Nation Place wanted some takeaways, right? So. I said, Jeff, what's on your checklist? Because you guys have like these rules, these unspoken rules about how you're gonna develop your place to make it compelling. So we're, everybody's getting their, their cameras out. So talk to us about a few of these that you think are big deals. Yeah, I, so I'm, I'm gonna start at the, the bottom first. Number 10 to me is the most important. Every one of our projects, we build in uh, the opportunity for public space. Um, all of them different sizes. Midtown, as an example, has a huge uh, outdoor TV uh, where we show football games and soccer games and we show the- Seasonal movies. Seasonal movies, yeah, mm -hmm. mo movies on the Monon. But um, we've learned in Carmel that, you know, we used to all gather at our mailboxes. That doesn't happen in a modern city anymore, or at least doesn't happen that much in Carmel anymore. And so we wanted a place where you could see and gather and meet and see, again, your friends, your neighbors, your colleagues. Have a beer. And have a beer. There's a lot of that going on. But it also, you know, the workers then, the, the employees of those buildings during the day, they also have a place that is unusual and different and entertaining for them to gather as well. So that's my favorite. Uh, yeah, no, 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 we can, uh, there it is again. So it, it, I think um, uh, investment in quality design right. is huge, not just cookie cutter BS. Exactly. So right? we, the, the developers hate us. And that's usually a huge part of that financial formula because we want uh, free outdoor uh, restrooms or we want obviously public parking or we want architecture that is extremely unique as you hopefully you can see and costs a lot of money. Uh, those kinds of things that we require it, it, in order to play in Carmel, you must accept that. And we own it, we demand it. Now everybody knows and it's worth it, but that's how we brought our community along as well. Yeah, and thank God someone in Indiana is doing that because Columbus, Indiana has a great design heritage and, and now Carmel does too. But listen, I did a lot of redevelopment work in Indianapolis and that's not a strong suit of theirs. And I'm in Chicago and design is the number one thing in Chicago that you want. So leadership. <clears throat> I was going to ask Rob for just one second because you have so many DMOs in the room and I, I really want to talk, Rob talked about a master plan that he's doing for us right now and this is probably the third study he's done for us um, and we don't pick him just because he's a hometown guy. He's, we, we always pick Rob because Rob is not, he's going to tell it to you straight. He's not, he never sugarcoats it. We, we have a lot of discussions and debates and I love that. But I want to say from a DMO perspective, it's that kind of um, business intelligence, that kind of mining of information and really trying to uh, under, help, help our cities um, understand. And they don't always want to hear it. I would like to say that Carmel does. <laughs> they don't always want to want to hear the reality of the situation, right? Um, but it's very important to me that we, that's probably the best role that we play is funding studies, funding data, funding all sorts of um, research and being a resource for them when they are trying to make thoughtful decisions. I mean, we're working with one of our other cities now and, and hopefully Rob will be too on another major decision. And I, that's how Grand Park, I think you did the test fit. We did a test fit. We did another test fit on it. And um, Multiple it, studies. it's far yeah. exceeded expectations. Um, and you have to be careful what you wish for, although it's really wonderful. Yeah. I just want you to know it's really wonderful. But um, it, it's just really important, I think. And I think that's why conferences like this are so important to understand the role of the, the you know, having the right partner. Um, and one of the things is that Carmel has, um, Carmel is one of three arts and arts districts that are designated by the state. And um, we, they were the first, by far the first. Yep. And um, they, they just do amazing work. Well, I appreciate you saying that, and I know we're running short on time soon. Okay. We've got a little, just a little video. It's not a DMO style video. That's like the sizzle reel that you guys are used to. It's more of just a, about the quality of life in Carmel. So I think they're going to start playing that with maybe a little music in the background. 
and we can kind of talk over it a little bit, and you can even um, discuss some of the things. Central but, Park is one of our most visited outdoor recreation areas. Yeah. yeah this is our uh, Monon, that's the Monon Trail that we really call our lakefront property. And through the middle of town, we widened it to uh, 80 feet across in order to activate the center of it. Uh, we created this arts and design district, which has those arches at all four entrances in order to give it its own place, its own destination. It's obvious that when you're in that area on our main street, you're in the arts and design district. That is the, the Palladium. And you've put a lot of your roads on road diets. Yeah, we have. Um, and a lot of skinny roads. Oh my gosh, roads. yes. Yes, in order They're to all on Ozempic. Yep. <laughs> we have a large sister city program with uh, multiple countries. I think the other thing, too, that you know, we want to continue to say is that, you know, placemaking takes a lot of time and effort. Um, a patience. lot of these things, a lot of these ideas have been here for years and years and years, and we all of these folks have just continued to push forward with the vision, the studies, you know, the, the vision studies, the feasibility studies, the financing studies, and then the architecture and the actual getting it done, uh, the leveraging of the financing. So there's, a, it, it's, you know, if you're a DMO and you're not used to the world of physical real estate development or you're an EDC and you're doing attraction and retention, but you're not in the world of real estate development, you know, come talk to us because I think that's the you should be a leader in that part of your placemaking too because you all are being unique versions and visions of yourself and you want to be the best version and vision of yourself and I think you know Carmel's just partway through its story but um, we felt it was a good time to show it off and um, I've been really inspired by working for Hampton County um, all these years and now with this big tourism master plan but we really just had to focus on Carmel for this because they've really embodied the true idea of an authentic uh, place. That in, in it, it can be a new place and still be authentic. So um, with that, we appreciate it. If anybody has there, any questions, there were we're happy questions, to take it. Yeah. yeah. I saw some. I would. Um, I would like to say that we work really closely with economic development in Carmel and all of our cities, and we also, at the county economic development, is a, we're partners, like as in they are on our staff. Um, they're an independent agency, but we have an MOU with them. So, so we are, really uh, I know we got one question in the back. We actually, they're giving us the old hook. Okay, so. Um, so we're gonna, we're gonna, <laughs> I think we're gonna come back to this corner if anybody would love to chat yeah. about this or anything else, and really appreciate you being here Thank today. You. Thank you. Thank you.